Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Here's what's at issue this week. Merci, Justin. Merci beaucoup. That thank you from Quebec Premier François Legault was one of many he has offered to the Prime Minister of late. A promise of billions of dollars to keep the Davy shipyard going in this case. Two days later, the two were at each other's side again to respond to the ice storm in the province. Gone for now are the complaints, replaced by enthusiastic cooperation. So what could this dynamic mean for the Liberals going forward? How might it affect the Conservatives as they try to gain ground in Quebec? Let's bring everybody in. Chantal Hébert, Althea Raj and Andrew Coyne, good to see you all. I should say that uh, Campbell Clark, uh, uh, Andrew's colleague, wrote about this today, but Chantal was emailing me about it <laughs> yesterday to say, I'm watching this and I'm wondering what's going on. So. When I put to a liberal today, is this uh, the beginning of a bromance? I was warned to not call it that and not say that, that was, that's what's happening <laughs> <Like>. now. <laughs> but what, what, what is happening here, Chantel? Yeah, and I did hook you on that topic by you using did. bromance, yes, but you I did. put it, uh, <laughs> I, I did not use it uh, as other, anything other than a quote. <laughs> a number of things are happening. I, I think uh, none of them are good for Pierre Poiliev and the Conservatives. For one, clearly Justin Trudeau is with uh, methodically uh, taking issues off the table that could become the core of a Quebec platform for the Conservatives in the next campaign. Roxham Road um, uh, and the issue of uh, the, the third party, uh, third safe country agreement. Um, agreement on how to uh, wed the Quebec Language Law and the Official Languages Act. And uh, a breakthrough for Davy, the big shipyard yeah. uh, that will now compete with uh, uh, two other shipyards for major contracts. Those are all issues that conservatives have campaigned on in Quebec in the past two, three campaigns. But in the bigger picture, and why I think it really doesn't bode well for uh, the Conservatives, is that what François Legault is doing at this point is basically doing a Doug Ford. He, he is stealing a page out of Ontario Premier Doug Ford's book of getting along with Justin Trudeau to get stuff in exchange. And I note that both premiers, rather important premiers, have not been rushing to meet with uh, Pierre Poiliev since he became conservative leader. Mm. So I don't think it's just Legault taking advantage. I think it's Legault and his pal Ford thinking we're probably getting a better deal from Trudeau than we would ever get from Pierre Poiliev, so let's dance with him. Mm. Uh, Pierre Poiliev was in Quebec this week as well. Um, uh, he was up, he was in Saguenay, I believe, but uh, you're right. I mean, he wasn't near Legault, but, but he also doesn't have billions of dollars to give to Legault. So, Andrew, is this sort of just a fair weather sentiment until something else happens that Quebec needs to complain about? Um, undoubtedly, but for now they're going to, you know, let it ride. But, it, you know, it's not only Quebec. You know, the government has been stuck behind, the Liberals have been stuck behind the Conservatives board by five or six percentage points for months now, and it's mm -hmm. pretty clear that the decision has been made to, you know, spend and pander their way out of it. Uh, so we've got the billions that was given out to the provinces to, for allegedly for health care to keep them quiet. We've got the dental care plan with the NDP. We've got the billions of dollars in industrial subsidies, a lot of which will go to central Canada. So you've got premiers beaming about that, but also business representatives. And in Quebec in particular, as Chantal mentioned, you know, they've basically thrown the asylum seekers under the bus uh, with the safe third country agreement uh, business. They've thrown the English community in Quebec under the bus with the, uh, you know, the quiescence on Bill 96 and the uh, new stuff in, in Bill C-13, the federal bill. Uh, we'll see if they ever do anything on Bill 21, but basically the religious minorities are, are so far are cooling their heels. So there's a lot of collateral damage that goes with that, but certainly from the government standpoint, uh, yeah, you, you, you throw out a lot of money like that, you don't do any, uh, don't get in their face on any of the difficult issues, of course you're going to buy a lot of thank yous and a lot of smiles. I'm surprised that, that you know, Logo didn't tip him in the bargain. Uh, you know, isn't that what you do when you get good service? <laughs> uh, I'll see you then, Chantal. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess like my colleagues, I would say is, this is not a bromance. This is um, the premier discovering and the prime minister discovering that federal money buys you a lot of friends if you're willing to dole it out. Um, I think, though, we will notice if there is a change in tone with the relationship with Legault if the Prime Minister keeps his mouth shut. And one thing that I noticed during that press conference earlier this week was 
there was a, a very pointed question about a Quebec issue that I don't think has gotten a lot of play in English Canada, but it was about two high schools in Laval, north of Montreal, who had set aside a prayer room for Muslim uh, teenagers to pray in, mostly because they were praying um, in uh, stair stairwells and they were causing uh, congestion issues. So they gave them a room. And the education minister happened to be at the press conference with the premier uh, when the Davies announcement was done. And he was asked, well, do you not think that this um, contravenes Bill 21? And Bernard Trinville said he was very preoccupied with the situation. And um, he said school in, the, in Quebec is secular and it will remain. And the day later, he came out and he announced that while he, this is his words, cannot ban prayer, he would ban prayer rooms. But the prime minister stood next to Mr. Dreville as he said that, and he said nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that type of silence that is going to in indicate whether or not the liberals are changing their tune when it comes to Quebec. Chantal. Oh, a couple of points on the... Uh, Pierre Poiliev being in Quebec, not for the first time, but not being anywhere near uh, François Legault, you need to compare comparables. So both Andrew Scheer and uh, Aaron O'Toole met François Legault very early on in their tenure as leader. It's not um, typical that uh, this meeting has never taken place, and it does speak to a lack of interest from the, uh, from the Premier. On the issues that Andrew describes, uh, as he describes them. The fact is that those were all stance that the Conservatives also campaigned on in the last two campaigns. Right. So it's not as if Justin Trudeau is suddenly um, breaking out of the pack by making all those concessions. Basically, Aaron O'Toole came to Quebec in the last campaign and promised all these things. Yeah. Uh, so there is no, in, in the play for votes, it basically leaves Poiliev with very little I to agree. campaign on since he'd already conceded all those points to Quebec. But I also think that the, uh, remember the resistance, quote unquote, yes. yeah. um, of uh, Premier Ford and others lining up at, behind Andrew Scheer uh, to campaign against Justin Trudeau. We are in a completely different era at this point. It's not mm -hmm. just Francois Legault, and I suspect when I look at what happened in Ontario, Premier Ford told his conservatives not to go out and campaign in the federal by-election in Mississauga. You are basically getting a sense that some premiers, most premiers, are telling themselves, we're not sure we want to do business with the Conservative Party under Pierre Poiliev, and that is going to be a problem. Yeah. Andrew. I, I think that will depend on the course of the polls. If, if, I mean, I'm not saying this will happen, but if the Conservatives were to build on their lead, at some point, I think premiers would see it in their advantage to, to right. try to curry favor with what would seem to be, the, at that point, uh, the next government. But obviously, a lot can happen between now and then. But certainly, Chantel's right that for conservatives, largely conservatives, no matter, I mean, the lesson of history on this, uh, with uh, one or maybe one or in one and a half exceptions, is you can pander all you want to Quebec nationalists, it's still not going to work for you. Uh, and so I think he should start to think about this pretty seriously, that, that the Liberals can always stay a little bit ahead of you. Can, they, can, they don't need to, you know, the, 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 the English minority in Quebec's got nowhere else to go. Uh, what, did, what was shown under Stephen Harper is if you are competitive enough in Ontario uh, and you win enough seats in Ontario and in the West, you can put together a governing majority. You don't need a lot of seats in Quebec, but Conservatives always seem to swing for the fences hoping against hope that if they just make you know, yeah. one more extravagant promise, they can turn the tide in Quebec. It's not going to happen for them. Last uh, 30 seconds to you, Althea. Well, I don't know if it's not going to work for them. I think it's too early to tell, and uh, local circumstances might determine a lot of that. But right. I do think that this is really just about money. I mean, the federal government is willing to spend billions of dollars on all types of subsidies, and the pro provincial premiers realize that they can have a piece of the pie, That's and they're right. just sticking their hand out. And Justin Trudeau is happy to give it to them, and it's buying local, like, conservative MPs have been shut on this. I mean, Mr. Poiliev is basically not criticizing the federal largesse that is going out the door. So it's absolutely no surprise that the premiers are um, recording favor with the federal government and being very complimentary, because why wouldn't you be?
Welcome back to another round of At Issue. After a record low turnout, voter turnout, the Ontario Election Officer is pushing for an end to polls in the final weeks of an election. The move is intended to increase voter turnout after a record low of 43% in Ontario's last election. The report found that many lost interest in the election after early polls showed one-sided results. So should polls be banned in those last two weeks of a campaign? Could it increase voter turnout? Should it be considered federally? Let's bring back everyone, Chantel, Andrew, and Althea. Andrew, why don't you start us off on this? Uh, I would think that information is good for voters, but I guess the chief electoral officer in Ontario uh, seems to think that this sways voters too much, or at least tells yeah. them, oh, your vote doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, it, it, this, this idea comes up every now and then. I recall people talking about it in the past, and they said, oh, the, there's a bandwagon effect. If one party's ahead, people will go and rush to vote for that party because they're ahead. Now we're hearing that it's, oh no, it's a reverse bandwagon effect. People see that one party's ahead and they stay home. Whether that has that impact or not, and I think there's a lot of debate about it, the point is, that's democracy. You know, people in a, in a democracy get to vote for whatever party they want, for whatever reason they want. It's not that you get to vote for the reasons that your betters think are appropriate. It means you get to vote for any reason with any information that's lawfully obtained that you find useful. So if people find it useful, to vote depending, you know, or not to vote depending on what the, what the polls are telling, that's their business, not ours. But, but if it's dissuading them from voting at all, Althea, does it need to be considered? It's one thing to, as Andrew says, you, you get to decide how you vote and, and, and what the decision is based on, but if it's causing you to not even bother to show up, should it be considered? Uh, so my gut instinct is no. I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of denying people information. Uh, I can understand the chief electoral officer's point. Like you can think that if the surveys hadn't uh, suggested back in 2016 that Hillary Clinton was going to win in a landslide, that more people would have gone out to the polls, possibly. At the same time, though, uh, to Andrew's point, you know, it's possible that if the polls had not shown an NDP swing in the 2011 election, that Bloc Québécois and Liberal voters in, um, in Quebec wouldn't have decided to give the NDP a second look, or perhaps Liberals would not have voted for Harper uh, and the Conservatives in 2011 and fearing an NDP government. So I just feel like, first of all, it's it's a bad idea to deny people information. It's also not feasible. Like, how are you practically going to ban this? And third, how, like, what would it say if the government is preventing you from having access to yeah. public opinion polling? Like, yeah. it, it's just so wrong on so many levels that I'm surprised it made its way into what one assumes is a, a heavily edited and vetted report. Chantal. So keeping people in the dark about the state of play is going to make them want to go out and vote. No, that's an interesting proposition. <laughs> is it possible that people decided not to go out to vote because they felt that neither the NDP or the Liberals were offering something that they believed was worth coming out for and fighting for? Absolutely. By their own admission, those two parties will tell you that they did not do a good campaign. But do polls impact uh, on the outcome of votes? Yes. I'll give you just one example. A week before the last Quebec referendum, the yes side for sovereignty was winning. Polls came out that showed that. A number of Quebec voters who just wanted to send a message looked at the numbers and said, gee, that's not really what we want to do with our vote. And in the end, there uh, was a narrow no. So, yes, voters are entitled to all the information, including the possible consequences of their vote, yeah. before they cast a ballot. Keeping them in the dark, one is treating, treating them like kids. It's very paternalistic. And two, I don't believe it's going to increase turnout. And just, so, just remember, yeah. you know, they, they might be banning the publication of polls. They wouldn't be banning the taking of polls. So all the people, mm -hmm. all the insiders would all have their, their polls at their command, would all have the information at their fingertips. The only people who would be kept out of the dark would be the voters. Okay, so, so to play devil's advocate, Althea, should the media spend less time talking about polls during an election? Would that help uh, with, with voter turnout? 
I don't know that it would help with voter turnout because I think polls can be a motivator for voter turnout. I think Chantal has given us yeah, a great example yeah, of that. Yeah. Uh, do we have a responsibility to uh, cover polls in a more responsive way, a responsible way? Absolutely. Should we be talking more about the issues that are actually at stake? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But the fact is, you know, now we can measure audiences and audiences like polls and they click on them. And that's why we write about them so often. So, uh, th take, for instance, the debate, which I find even crazier than the coverage of polls, about who won the leader de debate. <laughs> yes. And then you've got <laughs> which spin I make you all guys, over. Uh, which I make you guys weigh in on, to be fair. <laughs> uh, so uh, how would we really know? We're not yeah. in people's minds, yeah. but it is spun to death. I'm happy enough to have the reality check of a poll three days later to show me who actually won mm -hmm. the, the debate and what impact it's going to have on the campaign, but, but but without that, you are just free to have spin left, right, and center. I don't doubt my judgment, but I think my judgment on who wins leaders' debate leaves a lot to be desired. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, Andrew. What about the media's role in how they present polls uh, during elections? Yeah, I mean they should be reported upon, but they should be reported upon a lot less. Uh, we do far too much generally coverage of the campaign rather than the election, far too much about who's ahead and who's behind rather than what are they going to do if they get into power. Uh, so I think adjusting the mix, and certainly I don't think, I, one thing I think is we should not report on our own polls. When media commission polls, they have a direct incentive to hype them up whether they're actually significant or not. Uh, and it's really only the average of the polls. One last point is, you know, it, it, uh, uh, turnout is absolutely a serious issue. Yeah. Uh, and there's lots of things that are playing that. But if we were really serious about turnout, we'd make voting mandatory. When, uh, when Australia did it, they went from 58 percent to 95 percent, and they've stayed there ever since. Yeah. Uh, Chantal. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure uh, anyone is going to be brave enough to make voting mandatory. Uh, and it's a completely different discussion. Yes. But I, I don't think it's <laughs> either you ban polls or you make voting yeah. ban mandatory. Yeah. Banning polls, uh, I have not found very many uh, people who actually cover elections or who, who, who report on them or even parties to say, yeah, let's just keep the public from finding out about polls. I think the idea is should not even be on the table. Okay. Got to leave it there. Thank you. That was a good discussion. I appreciate it.